This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We continue to look now at a new campaign by civil rights groups urging the federal government to overturn a series of U.S. Supreme Court rulings that have for over a century been used as the legal justification to racially discriminate against people living in Puerto Rico and other U.S. territories. The rulings are known as the insular cases, which opponents have long denounced as some of the most racist U.S. Supreme Court rulings, firmly rooted in white supremacy to protect U.S. colonialism. The insular cases have allowed the U.S. federal government to deny Puerto Ricans living on the island voting rights access to public social programs like Medicaid and food stamps and other equal protections as those residing on the mainland U.S. The renewed efforts to overturn the insular cases has come about a month after the Supreme Court sided with the Biden administration to continue denying um, SSI, that's Supplemental Security Income Benefits, to seniors and people with disabilities living in Puerto Rico. The lone dissenter was Justice Sonia Sotomayor, whose parents were born on the island. She referred to the 8 to 1 ruling as irrational and antithetical. But what came as a surprise in this case was a 10 page concurring opinion written by the conservative justice Neil Gorsuch, calling on completely overthrowing the insular cases. In part, Gorsuch wrote, quote, a century ago in the insular cases, this court held that the federal government could rule Puerto Rico and other territories largely without regard to the Constitution. It's past time to acknowledge the gravity of this error and admit what we know to be true. The insular cases have no foundation in the Constitution and rest instead on racial stereotypes. They deserve no place in our law, the ultra-conservative justice Neil Gorsuch wrote. Well, for more, we're joined in New York City by Leah Fiomata, senior counsel for Latino justice, Pearl Duff, where her work focuses on economic justice and issues related to Puerto Rico. Latino justice, alongside the American Civil Liberties Union and other civil rights groups, have joined forces in this renewed effort to overrule the insular cases. Also with us um, is Juan, Juan Gonzalez, the co-host of Democracy Now! Juan, when you first responded to the Supreme Court decision and pointed out what Neil Gorsuch had said, in addition to Sonia Sotomayor, um, this was one of the most popular commentaries on our website. And so, we want to ask Leah, for starters, what is this campaign all about? How are you organizing and why are you doing it? Good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here. This campaign is pretty much coordinated between Latino Justice, Hispanic Federation, the ACLU, and Equally American, as well as other allies. But these are the main organizations. And we are um, we have embarked on a strong campaign, which started before the Valle of Madero decision was even issued, against the insular cases through public education, presentations, um, media contacts like this one as well. And also, we are embarked on a campaign to pressure, continue pressuring the Biden administration to denounce the insular cases and for federal courts to stop relying on them as well. Uh, our main concern, obviously, at this moment is to have the Supreme Court finally overrule the insular cases in a case that has been filed for cert um, for consideration of the Supreme Court, which is Fiti Semanu versus the United States, but also um, we want to pressure Congress to pass legislation to also support federal benefits programs, to treat residents of the territories equally. And uh, Leah, I wanted to ask you about the fit, uh, Fitisumanu versus United States case. This is a case of U.S. citizens from American Samoa. Uh, can you talk about that case and how it's similar to uh, the issues raised uh, in Puerto Rico and other U.S. territories? Well, first of all, the American Samoans are not American citizens, and that is at the crux of this case. They are considered United States nationals. So the case is to request or to demand U.S. citizenship, but also directly um, 
for the Supreme Court to overrule the insular cases. Um, the organization that I represent, Latino Justice, and others have joined in an amicus brief, a friend of the court briefed, um, asking the Supreme Court to take on the case, particularly because it is a frontal attack on the insular cases. And that is because the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals relied on the insular cases, even though they denounced them also and criticized them, but they said that the insular cases gives Congress the authority to make decisions about the territories and therefore relying on the insular cases, the 10th Circuit reversed the District Court of Utah that had uh, agreed with the plaintiffs that American Samoans should enjoy all citizenship rights as other uh, territories of the United States. One of the things that has struck me over the years uh, on the court decisions regarding Puerto Rico is the the absence of the so-called liberal justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was on there, Stephen Breyer, Justice Kagan, have not really uh, dared to tackle uh, the precedent set by the insular cases in any frontal way. I'm wondering your your thoughts on that and how this might uh, conceivably change, especially now that a an extreme conservative justice uh, like Gorsuch has taken such a strong stand. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in Valle Madero, civil rights activists, we were not necessarily expecting for Valle Madero to prevail. We were hoping that that would happen. But due to the conservative court, we were not really very much expecting that outcome, but we were terribly disappointed that the, like you mentioned, that the other liberal justices did not join the dissent, the strong and fantastic dissent of Sonia Sotomayor. So we are also grappling with that and hopefully in this next case that is um, pending, which is Fitu Semano, hopefully we might have a change because, as you know, um, in the Valle Madero decision, like you mentioned, both Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Gorsuch denounced the insular cases. And Justice Gorsuch had already hinted at this. Well, not really hinted. He had pretty much an oral arguments in November, asked the federal government, why don't we just overrule the insular cases? And the federal government, the solicitor general, kind of said, yeah, these are not great cases, but this is not the crux of this matter right now before you. So the, they kind of skirted of the issue. But Gorsuch had already signaled his opposition. And then, of course, in his concurrence in Valle Madero, which is very long and extensive and detailed, um, he provides even the historical context of the court, and he denounces them very, very strenuously. So we're hoping that um, both those of those justices and then hoping that the liberals as well. Now, obviously, we're going to have a new uh, liberal justice on the court at the time if this case is taken up by the court. So our fingers are crossed that this will be, hopefully, this will be the case that will finally have these cases overruled. Juan, you know, when you, uh, you know, shared this commentary on the insular cases, um, I was wondering if you could once again talk about why they're called insular cases, this whole century history, and why it is Justice Gorsuch, how it fits into the ultra-conservative philosophy of him to talk about these racist laws. Well, I think the, the key thing to understand is that in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War, when the United States acquired uh, the, uh, the, the remaining territories of the Spanish Empire, uh, including the Philippines, temporarily uh, Cuba as well, and, and Puerto Rico, and that, uh, that there was a debate as to, well, what's the relationship between these non-contiguous territories uh, of uh, of the United States, uh, these new uh, places where the, the American flag was planted, and the rest of the country. And so between uh, in the early 1900s, in a series of decisions, uh, a lot of them having to deal basically with tariffs and do tariffs apply, you know, it's a, it was a lot of commercial issues, uh, but there were also individual issues as to uh, what rights of the Constitution apply in Puerto Rico. Uh, so uh, 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 several cases, uh, Balzac versus Puerto Rico, Downs versus Bidwell, uh, and uh, a bunch of other cases, the court had to grapple with this and essentially uh, 
said that, yes, the, uh, the Constitution only applies in these territories at the uh, to the level which Congress decides it can apply, and that Congress has complete power to decide how to run these territories. And uh, so basically, it established the uh, the the legal basis for the holding of a colonial empire, uh, and uh, and so that is really has, has never really been challenged in a hundred years in any significant way, except in the last few years with the crises in Puerto Rico, especially, and and uh, uh, there have been several cases, and now of course this American Samoa case. So now for the first time, really. People are grappling with what it means, because in the meantime, there's been, uh, and, and I'm sure uh, Leah can talk much more extensively about this, how the insular cases have been used to provide second-class benefits to the people of Puerto Rico, especially. Because in some cases, even the Virgin Islands have been exempted by Congress from some of the more onerous uh, uh, second-class services that the government provides to the territories. Um, um, Leah, if you could talk about some Absolutely. of the, w the concrete ways uh, that this affects the people of Puerto Rico. Absolutely. I would also like to say that the insular case has established a doctrine that has no constitutional basis, which is a territorial incorporation doctrine. And the five inhabited colonies of the United States are considered um, unincorporated territories and only, quote unquote, fundamental rights apply to them. And those are decided by Congress arbitrarily. So in terms of Puerto Rico specifically, we know that the Valle Madero decision denies SSI benefits to the neediest Americans, the poor, disabled, blind, and elderly um, American citizens that reside in Puerto Rico. And there are other federal benefits as well that were not considered in that case. But there were other cases, for example, Peña Martinez, the, um, the Department of Health and Human Services, that case involved SSI as well as SNAP and Medicare other benefits in which Puerto Ricans on um, the residents of the island are treated unequally to the other states of the United States. And unfortunately, that case, which was being appealed at the First Circuit, I guess pretty much is moot at this point, as well as other cases in addition to that one. So yes, absolutely. The, the, the benefits and the decisions that have been applied to the different territories are very arbitrary. Um, I want to point out that the Northern Mariana Islands, they do have SSI, and that was part of the deed of session that was uh, decided Leo, with we the just have ten, we just have 10 seconds. What can Biden do specifically now? 10 seconds. President Biden needs to denounce the insular cases, needs to instruct federal— well, he cannot instruct them, but needs to exhort federal courts to stop utilizing and relying on that, and needs to Leo also— Leo Mata, we have to leave it there, senior counsel for Latino Justice Pearl Def. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.